Okay, we're going to look at HC 2.2, which deals with the aims of punishment. This is also picked up again in AC 2.3, and I've got a com uh, an amalgamation of both of these. So this PowerPoint's going to explain to you what the aims of punishment are. It's going to explain how it fits in with the criminal justice system. But I'm going to start particularly with looking at the syllabus as it stands. So you are expected to know what the five aims of punishment are. Uh, the syllabus names these as retribution, rehabilitation, deterrence, public protection and reparation. There are alternate names for some of these, but that's the language that the syllabus uses. But much more importantly, look over here. It looks, it's asked you to think about how these five aims tie in with the criminological theories that you learned in unit two. So this is stressing once again, I'm going to show this as we go through the PowerPoint, that even though we're doing unit four, an examine unit, you've got a syllabus, the expectation is that you should be able to pull in some of the stuff from unit one, two and three where it is relevant. So don't think just because you finish those units, you're doing exam unit four, that you can't bring in some of the stuff that you've done in other units. In fact, the expectation is there. So let's just go through a little bit of a refresh before we look at what these five specific aims are. The aims of our penal system, in other words, our, our punishment system in this country, um, you might ask the question, well, what's the purpose behind punishment? Why do we punish? And there are a number of different reasons for why we punish criminals. One of the reasons we punish is to prevent recidivism, is to prevent reoffending. We also punish to deter others from committing crime. We punish to reform people, to rehabilitate them. We punish criminals as a payback, uh, expressing the fact that we as a society will not stand for their criminal ways. That's reparation. And we punish as a way of revenge, which is retribution. So as you can see, the five aims of punishment link in to the reason why we punishment and, you, and why we punish, which you hope they would do as they are the aims of punishment. And of course, finally, we punish to keep the public safe, public protection. Now, there are four categories of punishment that are given out in courts in today's society. We have custodial sentences. These can be mandatory or discretionary life sentences or fixed term sentences or suspended sentences. We have community sentences, which can be a combination of unpaid work, a curfew, drug treatment, supervision, other treatment programs such as anger management. And when we looked at the work of the probation service, they are responsible for running those community sentences. So they are non-custodial and take place within the community. Then we have fines. They will very much depend on the financial circumstance of the offender. In general, fines are means tested, which means that someone who earns a lot will get a bigger fine than someone who doesn't earn a lot. It's seen as being proportional to the income you receive. And also they will take into account the seriousness of the, defense, of the offence. And the final category or punishment that are meted out by courts in today's society are discharges. And these could be the conditional or absolute. A conditional discharge uh, means the person doesn't actually get any punishment. They just get um, the, uh, the concept that if they re-offend, usually uh, a time scale we put on that up to three years maximum, the courts may revisit the case and impose a different sentence. If you have an absolute discharge, no penalty is imposed whatsoever. Although the defendant is guilty, they're considered to be morally blameless. Uh, and this is the idea that the trauma of the court case itself is punishment enough for the defendant. Let's remind ourselves of who, where our court systems are, who can give out punishments. Uh, in a Crown Court, it's a judge. They have unlimited powers. They're just restricted by the sentence the offence carries. So, for instance, uh, if someone's found guilty of theft, they cannot give a sentence of more than seven years. If someone's found guilty of murder, 
they have to give a life sentence. The judge, however, can impose the minimum sentence that the, the perpetrator must serve. Magistrates, on the other hand, have limited powers. For one offence, they can only give six months maximum prison or a fine, or for two or more offences, 12 months maximum prison or a fine. Remember, magistrates' courts try summary or either way offences, and Crown courts try indictable or either way offences. Remember, in a lot of textbooks, um, that it will say that magistrates can give a fine of up to £5,000. That is now incorrect. The fines are limitless in a magistrate's court now. There is no, um, no ceiling placed on the amount of fine that a magistrate can give, even though they will still be means tested. So why do we punish? Well, here's a good exam quote. Section 142 of the Criminal Justice Act says the purpose of sentencing is the punishment of offenders, the reduction of crime, including its reduction by deterrence, the reform and rehabilitation of offenders, the protection of the public, and the making of reparation by offenders to persons affected by their offence. Now, when judges sentence, when magistrates sentence, the three R's should be present within the sentencing. The idea of rehabilitation, reparation and retribution. But let's go back to this statement from Section 142 of the Criminal Justice Act. Look at what it's saying here. It's mentioning deterrence, rehabilitation, protection, reparation. And it uses the word punishment here, which is basically retribution. So what the syllabus has done in outlining its eight, five aims of punishment is it's taken section 142 of the Criminal Justice Act and it's taken that and used it as the basis for this uh, assessment component. So having this quote I think plays into the hands of the examiner and it's a really good one to have and it reinforces what the syllabus is trying to do here. So I would use this if I were in your shoes. So let's start by looking at these five aims of punishment. And the first one we're going to look at is retribution. It literally means paying back, inflicting punishment on an offender for a wrongful or criminal act. It's based on the ideas that criminals should get their just deserts, that the punishment a criminal receives should fit the crime. It should be proportional to what they've done. It's based actually on the biblical concept in the Old Testament of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is why some people who hold that retribution is your key aim of punishment argue that the death penalty should be reintroduced for murder because it is a punishment that fits the crime. It is proportional. You've taken a life, we take your life in retribution for that. It would be also true to say that if you go down this idea of proportionality, the punishment fitting the crime, it does lead to a tariff style system of justice where you have fixed mandatory penalties for different offences. But all in all, retribution's main purpose is to express society's outrage at a crime. And you can illustrate this by the fact that we have uplift sentencing. So to give an example of this, I've used hate crimes. So hate crimes such as racially motivated offences actually carry an uplift. So the maximum sentence in courts at the moment for GBH is five years. But if that GBH is racially motivated, the judge can actually increase that to seven years. And what that's doing is expressing society's greater outrage at the defense, at the offense. GBH is unacceptable, but racially motivated GBH is even more unacceptable in today's society. And here's a medieval form of retribution, the Scold's Bridle. Um, it was a metal brace put over the heads of women 
from the 16th century onwards. We don't use it today. And it had a metal plate in the mouth. So here there would be a metal plate that went into the person's mouth and pressed the tongue down, making it impossible for the woman to speak. It was only given to women in our enlightened sexist times of the 16th century. And it was a public shaming publishment, a punishment. It was retribution. It was for when women were nagging, spreading gossip or lies that often affected respectable people. Now, what you see here is the fact that the aims of punishment, when, when a method of punishment is given out, it doesn't just fulfill one aim. Actually, sometimes it can fulfill all five aims. So here you could start to argue that this punishment not only is retribution, it's also a form of deterrent because when other members of society see the woman with this skull's bridle on, they will start to think, hmm, I don't fancy that. I will not nag my husband or spread gossip and lies, etc., etc., etc. So the wearing of the skull's bridle is not just retribution, it also acts as a deterrent. It fulfills two different aims of punishment. Now, you would think that retribution didn't, uh, you know, that we wouldn't see things like the skull's bridle uh, so much in today's society. But if you go over to America, uh, they put retribution um, at the forefront. And there are some very interesting punishments that are retributive dished out by judges in American courts. We'll have looked at these clips in the lesson, but if you're following this on MP4 on YouTube, you're just going to have to type in those clips and have a look at what I mean by that. But some interesting stuff on there. There's quite a few videos in this PowerPoint, so when you see the clip, we've looked at it in class, but you, if you're looking on YouTube, can go and look at the copy the link and go and see what we're talking about. I won't refer to these anymore. Uh, we've also got here modern examples such as the media. This is a link through to the Plymouth Evening Herald, which names and shames local criminals. So I've touched on this, this idea that retribution is very much linked to revenge. It contains an element of it in that, the, in that society and the victim are being avenged for the wrongdoing that the criminal has undertaken. For example, Longer prison sentences for causing death by dangerous driving were justified in this way. These longer prison sentences were an outcome of a very lengthy campaign by relatives of uh, those who suffer from death by dangerous driving, the Drive for Justice campaign. And again, this links through to previous units, Unit 1, Campaigns for Change. So again, you can bring in stuff from other units. Okay. So what you see is that uh, the maximum prison sentence was increased for, for this crime from five to ten years in 93 and in the Criminal Justice Act of 2003 the maximum sentence went up from 10 to 14 years. So in the space of um, tw under 20 years the maximum penalty for death by dangerous driving has gone from five to 14 years due to pressure groups and campaigns for it to change because it was seen that the sentence was not enough. It was not enough retribution. And there's a link through to that campaign for you if you wish. So let's look at our links through to our criminological theories with retribution. Well, it's closely linked to right realist theories of criminality, which tend to be tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. Functionalist sociologists such as Durkheim would argue that the moral outrage that retribution expresses performs the function of maintaining social boundaries. Punishing the offender reminds everyone else of the difference between right and wrong, and that's its function. If you're going to evaluate retribution, these are some of the things you might want to think about. Some people might argue that offenders deserve forgiveness or a chance to make amends, not just punishment. It's not enough. Fixed tariff systems may mean that a punishment has to be inflicted when no good's going to come from it. For instance, you could have a very remorseful offender who would never commit that crime again, but nevertheless has to be punished because we are going down that idea of retribution. 
is that of value, you could argue. And then the other thing you need to consider is how you decide what is a proportional penalty or just desert, because actually this is very subjective. People disagree as to which crimes are more serious than others. So can you ever really have a proportionate response if the, uh, the seriousness of crime is subjective and differs from person to person? So this now moves us on to our next um, aim of punishment, which is rehabilitation. It's the idea that punishment can be used to reform or change offenders so they no longer offend and go on to live a crime free life. So it's not focusing on punishment, but focusing on trying to change the offender's future behaviour by addressing the issues that lead to their offending in the first place. So under rehabilitation, we're going to be introducing things like treatment programmes, which are going to be extensively used, such as education and training programmes, both in and outside of prison, anger management courses, drug treatment and testing orders, these sort of things. And obviously community service orders often include requirements for under offenders to engage in these sorts of programmes as part of their sentence. So that's where we're going with rehabilitation. So you need to consider the following when addressing rehabilitation. Because rehabilitation pol policies generally require offenders to actively want to change their life. They're not going to work if the offender doesn't want to change their criminality. So that's something to consider. And the other thing you need to consider is that rehabilitation policies are expensive. They require considerable resources, professional support, therapists, probation officers, etc, etc, etc. However, you could argue that the initial expense ultimately will prove worthwhile in the long term and in the long term will be cheaper given the cost of keeping someone behind bars. Not just the daily cost, of it's about £180 a day, I think, to keep someone behind bars, but also the fact that while someone is behind bars, they're not working, they're not paying tax, they're not contributing to society. So the reality is that the initial outlay, the, resource, the expense on resources to try and rehabilitate may in the long run prove to be cheaper than keeping someone in prison for the rest of their life. You need to nip the criminality in the bud early on to stop the expensive outlay in later life. You can argue that whichever way you want. How does this link to unit two? Well, individualistic theories will see rehabilitation as a significant aim of punishment. And they would advocate things like cognitive theories, uh, cognitive behavioural therapies. Uh, so cognitive theories will say, let's do some cognitive behavioural therapy, teach offenders to correct the thinking errors and biases that lead to their criminal behaviour. I think personality theory might favour the use of aversion therapy to, def to offending behaviour. Skinner's operant uh, conditioning would support the use of token economies to encourage prisoners to behave more acceptably. And sociological theories such as left realism are going to really favour rehabilitation because they are saying that social factors such as unemployment, poverty and poor education are the causes of crime. Therefore, if you address those needs within society, offending is going to be, re uh, uh, is going to be reduced. There's the link to Bastoy Prison, very interesting uh, prison in Norway. And there's the link to a Miami boot camp video to give you an idea of how America does it differently. And some more links there which raise that debate of whether to punish or to rehabilitate. You can look at those at your leisure. Let's look at number three, which is deterrence. And deterrence aims to dissuade the offender or anyone in society from committing crime through fear of punishment. And Basically, deterrence comes in two forms. It's either individual in that it applies to the offender only, or it's general in that it regards it, uh, it applies to society as a whole. So you have individual deterrence and general deterrence. So let's look at individual deterrence. That aims to ensure that the individual offender does not reoffend. 
So an example of this might be a suspended sentence. Um, there's no, um, if that person abides by the terms of the suspended sentence, uh, they, they've got that, uh, the thought of a prison sentence hanging over their head if they reoffend during the time of the suspended sentence, and because of that, they do not offend. So deterrence works, the deterrence of the real sentence if they break the suspended sentence. If we go with general deterrence, that's much more about affecting society as a whole. So we're trying to stop people in society from breaking the law. So if the public see an individual offender being punished, they will see what they themselves will suffer if they commit a similar crime. So by making an example of the individual, it has the general effect of teaching everyone else in society the lesson as well. So in past, general deterrence was usually done through public punishments such as executions, floggings, putting offenders in the stocks, so that everyone could see for themselves the consequences of offending. That doesn't happen so much nowadays, um, other than in America, as you've seen from the previous videos, but today the public are much more likely to learn about the cost of offending from the media, from TV, newspapers, etc, etc. How does this link to Unit 2? Well, right realism will favour deterrence, as a means, I should say deterrence, not deterrence, I spelled that wrong, as a means of crime protection. And of course, social learning theory is relevant because if would-be offenders see a model, i.e. one of their peers being punished for offending, they'll be less likely to imitate that behaviour. But there are some criticisms of deterrence or things you could use to evaluate its effectiveness. Um, for instance, there is little evidence that short, sharp shock treatments or boot camps reduce youth offending. Uh, the studies have been done in both the UK and the USA, and there is little evidence to um, say that those types of um, deterrent, the more unpleasant deterrents, um, actually reduce reoffending. In fact, the fact that half of all prisoners reoffend within a year of release in this country suggests that prison itself is not an effective deterrent. It also assumes that offenders act rationally, carefully weighing up the risks. But actually, we know that some offenders act irrationally. They're driven by emotions without the thought for punishment, the, you know, the result of punishment from their actions. And this applies particularly to the death penalty, because you think that when the death penalty was abolished, if the death penalty was an effective deterrent, the murder rate would have gone up in this country. But in reality, when we abolished the death penalty, the murder rate actually went down, which suggested that it never acted as a deterrent to people who were thinking of committing murder. So having dealt with deterrents, let's move on to public protection or sometimes called incapacitation. And this punishment is, is when punishment is used to protect the public from further offending by incapacitating the offenders. Incapacitation is the use of punishment to remove offenders' physical capacity or ability to offend again. There are many types of incapacitation policy at different times and places. So here's some of, some of the many that are used throughout time and indeed in society today. The execution of offenders prevents them from committing any further crimes whatsoever. There's incapacitation. If you're dead, you can't be committing any more crimes. Custodial sentences incapacitate, they protect the public because the person's locked up. The cutting off of hands of thieves prevents them stealing in the future. Uh, if you haven't got a hand, difficult to nick without one. The chemical castration of sex offenders protects the public from their sexual urges. Foreign, foreign travel bans, that should say, not bans. Foreign travel bans to prevent football hooliganism, hooligans attending matches abroad protect society from their loutish behavior. And curfews and electronic tagging also prevents offending by restricting offenders' movements. And there's a, a link to chemical castration for those that want to have a look at it. Now, imprisonment is actually our main means of incapacitation in today's societies. 
It's an important part of the claim that prison works because it takes offenders out of circulation and prevents them from committing further crimes against the public. And it would be true to say that incapacitation for public protection has influenced sentencing laws. For example, the Crime Sentences Act of 97 introduced mandatory minimum jail sentences for repeat offenders. So what I was saying is if we've got an offender that keeps, keeps on committing crime, you know, clearly um, deterrence isn't working, our system isn't deterring them from committing the crime, we've got to just bang them up and protect the public from these habitual recidivists. And so what that act did is it said that there would be automatic life sentences for anyone that committed a second serious sexual or violent offence. It said that there would then be a seven year minimum sentence for a third class A drug trafficking offence, a three year minimum sentence for a third domestic burglary conviction. So the emphasis of that act was very much on public protection. Similarly, the Criminal Justice Act of 2003 also introduced the concept of imprisonment for a public protection uh, because this allowed the courts to give an indeterminate sentence to a dangerous offender who is convicted for certain serious violent or sexual offences. So if the judge thought that this person even when released would not be um, rehabilitated actually what you've got is an indeterminate sentence they are banged up until it can be shown that they're they, if they are released, the public are safe. How does this link to Unit 2? Well, biological theories. Uh, Lombroso believed that criminals were biologically different from the rest of the population, and so they couldn't be rehabilitated. And he advocated uh, sending them away and putting them all on an island together, away from society. Uh, and you've got other forms of biological theories. Uh, would favour things such as chemical castration to incapacitate sex offenders. I've touched on that in, in earlier slides. If we look at right realism, they would see, uh, realist, right realists would see incapacitation as a way of protecting the public from crime. Uh, they would argue you've got a small number of persistent offenders, they're responsible for the majority of crimes, so you incapacitate them with long prison sentences, and by doing that you significantly reduce the crime rate. So let's look at some criticisms or some evaluation of protection and incapacitation. The reality is if you're going down that route it leads to longer sentences therefore more expense. An ever rising prison population and of course the costs that go with it. Also, incapacitation is just a strategy of containment, of risk management, and it's not dealing with any of the causes of crime or endeavouring to change offenders into law-abiding citizens. When you look at America and you look at people who've got 600-year sentences, you know, five life sentences one after the other, there's no attempt at rehabilitation whatsoever. It's incredibly expensive. Also, the three strikes and you're out principle effectively is re-punishing individuals for their previous crimes and at the same time it could be argued it's unjust because in a sense it's imprisoning them for crimes that the law assumes they're going to commit in the future and many people argue that is not just. So that moves us on to our final aim of punishment which is reparation, a link to some stuff on reparation there. And reparation aims to ensure the defendant pays back to the victim or society for their wrongdoing. It's repayment, reparation. It may take the form of such things as financial compensation to the victim, such as paying the cost of repairing damage done to someone's property, if there's vandalism, for instance. Or it could be unpaid work to make reparation to society through community payback schemes, for example, removing graffiti from public buildings, tidying up gardens, etc, etc. And linked with reparation is this concept of restorative justice, making amends for the social damage done. So that involves the offender, or trying to get the offender, to recognise the wrongfulness of their actions. And restorative justice scheme involve bringing the offender and the victim together with the help of a mediator. 
and this allows the victim to explain to the offender the impact the crime has had on them and hopefully then the offender can come to appreciate the harm they've caused and express their remorse and seek forgiveness and thereby bringing some closure to the victim and allowing some form of reintegration of the offender into society. And there's some links to some stuff on restorative justice for you. Now, how does this link to uh, Unit 2? Well, labelling theory would favour restorative justice as a way of reintegrating offenders into mainstream society because it enables them to show remorse, it permits reintegration and prevents them being pushed into secondary deviance through the fact that they've been labelled as a criminal, they can't shake that label, they haven't been forgiven, so let's just carry on with our antisocial criminal behaviour. Functionalists such as Durkheim argue the restitutive justice, the reparation to put things back to how they were before the crime was committed, is essential for the smooth functioning of complex modern societies. But there are some criticisms. So reparation may not work for all types of offence. Compensation for damage to property or minor offences is fairly straightforward. But can reparation be made for sexual or violent crimes? A rape victim may not want to face or forgive the rapist. And as P.D. James says here, murder is a unique crime, the only one for which we can never make reparation to the victim. By definition, you can't do restorative justice reparation for murder. You know? And some people regard reparation as too soft a form of punishment. It lets offenders off lightly. And this finally brings us in to sum up all these five aims of society. Because, um, because these five aims of punishment come under the all-encompassing umbrella of denunciation. Even though it's not mentioned in the syllabus, it's in all the textbooks. So denunciation aims to show offenders that society disapproves of their behaviour and that it's unacceptable conduct. It's reinforcing moral and ethical codes and, and re-establishing boundaries. These boundaries may change over time as to what's acceptable with the society. So for example, I've used the example of smoking cigarettes. It was once acceptable and even encouraged by the medical profession, but now it's illegal in the workplace and in a motor vehicle with a child passenger. So denunciation is showing offenders that society disapproves of their actions. And that's actually what all five aims of punishment are reflecting, this idea of denunciation in some form or another. So as we move to our final slide, and this is to get you to think and evaluate right at the end. So here you've got a number of different punishments that we give out in today's society. And I want you to think as you go through this of these punishments like community service, curfews, the death penalty, electronic tagging. If you're going to take the five aims of punishment, which of those five aims does each of these sentences most reflect. And actually, I think you'll find as you go through this, some of these categorically go with one of those aims more than the other. But others, it's much more of a grey area. And that allows you to think and to evaluate. I hope you found this PowerPoint useful. Goodbye.